Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug and I'd like to welcome you back to my channel. In this video, we're going to be learning how to write formulas for ionic compounds. If you're new here, go ahead and take a look around. I think you'll like what you see. And if you do, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And if you like what you see here and you, you learn something from this video, I would love it if you would hit that like button as well. That really does help the algorithm. Well, as we take a look here, we're going to be writing formulas for ionic compounds. And just as a reminder, we said in an earlier video of this series that ionic compounds are composed of ions. And what that means is an ionic compound will have a cation, it's going to have an anion, something that's positively charged and something that's negatively charged. And these ionic compounds are going to be held together by what we sometimes call electrostatic attractions. That just means that the positively charged ions are going to be very strongly attracted to the negatively charged ions and they're going to be held together as a compound. Now, as we work through these examples, it's important to realize that there are a lot of cations and anions that we could possibly be using as we write these formulas. So if you're taking a chemistry class right now, your teacher has probably given you or will give you something that looks kind of like this, an ion chart. Now if you would like to use my ion chart that I have here, you're welcome to use this. I'm going to put a link to the PDF version of this in the description down below. So you can go ahead and download this and use this particular ion chart as you uh, write these formulas. Now, as we take a look at this ion chart, you might notice that there's a vocabulary word on here that we might want to address. You might notice that it talks about monatomic ions and polyatomic ions on the ion chart here. So what does that mean? Well, the word monatomic, as we see in several places here, that just means it's an ion that has one atom in it. So all of these that are listed as monatomic uh, uh, ions, whether they're cations or anions, have one atom in there. On the other hand, polyatomic ions, and we have just a couple polyatomic ions on the cation side. We have a lot of polyatomic ions on the anion side, these are ions that have more than one atom in them, sometimes many atoms. In fact, if you look at the ion chart, you can see that some of these polyatomic ions have two atoms in them, like in the case of cyanide or hydroxide. Some of these have even more. For example, we can see that dichromate, which is right here on the ion chart, has as many as nine atoms in it. So that certainly is a good example of a polyatomic ion. Now here we have the steps that we're going to use as we write these formulas for ionic compounds. Now this list of seven steps looks very lengthy and confusing, but we're going to work our way through these and I hope you'll find that by the end of this video that working through these steps is actually fairly straightforward and, fa and fairly simple and Hopefully you won't even need this list of seven steps as we work through them. So the first thing here says, note the name of the cation and write its formula. Uh, make a note of its charge. And then note the name of the anion and write its formula. Make a note of its charge. If the absolute values of the charges are equal, then you're finished. But if the absolute values of the charges are not equal, you're going to swap the charges on the ions using those charges as subscripts. And then we have one last step. If we're ever asked to place a subscript on a polyatomic ion, place parentheses around the polyatomic ion. So we'll see examples of all of these steps here coming up. So we're going to jump right into this and do lots and lots of examples so you can see how to write the formulas for ionic compounds. So we'll start with calcium sulfide. Now step one says note the uh, formula or the symbol of the cation. So calcium is our cation here. Calcium has the symbol Ca. So I'm going to write that down. And the charge on calcium, we can look at the periodic table or your ion chart if you prefer and see that calcium has a charge of positive 2. So I'm going to write that down here. Now sulfide is sulfur, right? So it's S and its charge is negative 2. So I can see that by looking at the periodic table. It's in group 16. All of those are negative 2 that are anions. 
Uh, or I could just look at my ion chart and see that sulfide is a negative 2. Now the next step, step 5, says if the absolute values of the charges are equal, then you're finished. And guess what? They are equal. Plus 2 and minus 2, they essentially cancel out. So I'm going to put the two ions together just like this, and that's the formula for calcium sulfide, C-A-S, and that's all you have to do. Now let's try another example. Let's try sodium oxide this time. So sodium has the symbol Na, and we can look at the periodic table and see that it's in group uh, 1 on the far left-hand side of the table, so it has a charge of positive 1. And then oxide is O, of course, and that's in group 16 uh, toward the right side of the table. Those have a charge of negative 2. And rule number 5 says that if the absolute values of the charges are equal, then you're finished. But that's not the case that we have here. It looks like the charges don't cancel out. Step 6 says if the absolute values of the charges are not equal, we have to swap the charges making those charges into subscripts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scoot these together, and then this 2 right here is going to become the subscript on sodium, and then the 1 becomes the subscript on oxide. But I'm not going to write 1s. We, we don't write 1s as subscripts. So here's how we're going to write this, Na2O. So the fact that we have that formula here tells us that this formula unit has two atoms or two ions of sodium and one ion of oxide. Let's try another one. Let's try nickel 2 phosphide. So nickel is Ni, and the charge of nickel is positive 2. Now, on many ions, in fact, specifically most of the time transition metal ions, we're going to see a number in parentheses. That number in parentheses tells us what the charge on that ion is. So nickel 2 is, well, positive 2 in charge. That is placed there on those transition metals because nickel and most transition metals can have more than one possible charge. So we have to specify. So nickel 2 is plus 2 and phosphide is P. Now we can look at our ion chart or at the periodic table and see that phosphide is negative 3. Now since the charges do not cancel, we have to swap the charges, just like we did on the last one. So that means that when we scoot these together here, this 2 right here is going to become the subscript on the phosphorus, and the 3 is going to become the subscript on the nickel, just like this. So the formula for nickel 2 phosphide is going to be Ni3P2. So that's how you uh, write the formula for nickel 2 phosphide. Let's try another one. Let's try cesium hydroxide. Now, cesium is Cs, and we can look at the periodic table or your ion chart if you prefer and see that its charge is positive 1. Now, hydroxide is not an element. It's a polyatomic ion. So this is where you have to refer to that ion chart that I showed you earlier. Hydroxide has a formula of OH, and its charge is negative 1. So once again, do the charges cancel out, or do we have to swap them? Well, they cancel out, don't they? Positive 1 and negative 1 cancel out. So we just scoot these two ions together. It becomes CSOH, cesium hydroxide. Let's try another one. Let's try tin 2 nitrate. Now, tin has the formula SN, and the 2 there represents the fact that tin has a charge of positive 2, and then nitrate is a polyatomic ion. We can look at the ion chart and see that nitrate has the formula NO3, and its charge is negative 1. So once again, do the charges cancel, or do we have to swap them? Well, they don't cancel, do they? Plus 2 and minus 1 don't cancel out, so we have to swap them. So we're going to scoot these together here, and we're going to swap these charges. So the 2 is going to go down here as the subscript on nitrate, but do you see a little problem with the formula the way we have it written here? If you were to look at this, it looks like we have a formula of SNNO32, and that doesn't seem right, does it? 
it looks like we have a two. We're placing this subscript onto a polyatomic ion. Well, let's look at step seven in that list of seven steps. It says that if we're placing a subscript on a polyatomic ion, we place parentheses around the formula of the ion. So do you see why that's practical? This two here that we just wrote is supposed to apply to the entire polyatomic ion, doesn't it? So by placing the parentheses around that, we can see that we actually have two of everything that's in that polyatomic ion. So we have uh, one tin atom. We have actually two nitrogen atoms, one times two, and we actually have six oxygen atoms three times two. So the parentheses here are very practical for helping us to keep everything straight in this formula. And by the way, this uh, also keeps us from looking like we have a formula of SNNO32. So that's kind of a side benefit of these parentheses here. Let's try another formula, silver phosphate. Now silver has the symbol AG. And if we can look at our ion chart, we can see that silver has a uh, charge of positive one, and then phosphate is a polyatomic ion. It's the very last ion on the ion chart that I showed you earlier. Phosphate has a formula of PO4, and its charge is negative three. So once again, do the charges cancel, or do we have to swap them? Well, we have to swap them, don't we? Because plus one and minus three don't cancel out. So I'm gonna scoot these together, and then when I swap the charges, it's AG3. PO4. No parentheses because we're not placing any additional subscript onto that polyatomic ion. Let's try ammonium chromate this time. So once again, ammonium actually is also a polyatomic ion. It's one of the very few uh, positively charged polyatomic ions that we work with in first year chemistry. So ammonium is NH4. It has a charge of positive one. And then we have chromate. Chromate has the formula CrO4, and its charge is negative two. You can see all these on the ion chart there. Once again, do the charges cancel out, or do we have to swap them? Well, they don't cancel out, do they? So we have to swap them. So when you scoot these together, we're going to put a two right down here. And I think we can see that we need parentheses, don't we? That two, on the ammonium is going to apply to the entire polyatomic ion. Also, you don't want that to look like a 42. So we have nh 42 cro 4 So if you start to count up the number of atoms in this formula unit, we actually have two atoms of nitrogen. We have eight atoms of hydrogen, four times two. We have one chromium atom and there are four oxygen atoms. So I think when you add that together, you see that we actually have 15 atoms total in this uh, formula unit, in this compound. So that's a lot of atoms, isn't it? Let's try another one here, titanium to chloride. So we know that titanium is an element that has the symbol Ti, and that two right there uh, shows us that the charge on titanium is positive two, and then chloride, we're gonna to have to find that on the ion chart, and chloride has the formula ClO2, and its charge is negative one. So once again, do the charges cancel, or are we gonna to have to swap them? Well, we're gonna to have to swap them, aren't we? So when we scoot these together, we're going to have to take this two up here and place that down here as the subscript for chloride. And once again, it looks like we need parentheses, don't we? Because we're placing a subscript onto a polyatomic ion. So Ti and then ClO2 in parentheses with a two right there. Let's try another one, dinitrogen trifluoride. Now, as you look at this compound, it looks a little different from the others, doesn't it? We have these numeric prefixes. You might remember from the last video that anytime we have numeric prefixes, we don't worry about charges and swapping and all that and ions. We just use the numeric prefixes as the subscripts for each element, don't we? So dinitrogen implies that we have two atoms of nitrogen, and trifluoride implies that we have three atoms of fluorine. So it's N2F3. 
So once again, we need to be able to differentiate between those molecular compounds, those covalent compounds that we learned about in the last video, and the ionic compounds that we're primarily focusing on in this video. Once again, if a chemical compound's name has these numeric prefixes like di and tri and tetra and all that, we're dealing with a covalent or a molecular compound, and we write the formula like this. However, if there are no numeric prefixes, we're going to use those steps that we learned earlier in this video. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this video, and more importantly, I hope you learned something from it. If you did, please smash that like button. I would really appreciate it. In the next video, we're going to learn to go in the other direction. We're going to take an ionic formula, and we're going to learn to write the name from that formula. I hope to see you in that video. Thanks for watching.